Hello, this is Dr. Eric Bricker and welcome to A Healthcare Z. Today we're going to be discussing population health matching. And so this is a fairly complicated topic. And actually many of you have asked for more sort of sophisticated videos that are maybe even longer in form. Well, I'm very um, you know, humbly honored that you have asked me for that. So this is gonna fall into that category. So this is this talk is not for the faint of heart. All right, so what we have here is a series of diagrams. And so this first diagram is a bell-shaped curve with on the y-axis we have the number of employees or plan members and on the x-axis we have the complexity of their healthcare situation. So on the far side it might be something as you know somebody who is otherwise healthy and just needs an annual flu shot to somebody in the middle that might have a chronic condition like let's say well-controlled diabetes or hypertension and then all the way over to the most complex side where you would have somebody like with a complex cancer diagnosis or complex uh, spine or joint replacement, maybe complex uh, aortic valve replacement, etc. All right, now because uh, an employee population typically falls along a normal or a bell-shaped curve distribution, what I have superimposed here is a line representing the healthcare costs associated with the plan members along that complexity. In other words, as you come further to this side, the more complex patients drive higher healthcare costs, right? And again, if you go one standard de deviation to the side, you're gonna end up with about 17% of the employees that are in that tail, right? 17% is pretty close to 20%, right? So it's, again, it's close to that 80-20 rule where 80% of the claims are generated by 20% of the employees, okay? So it's important to know that across your employee population, you're gonna have this normal distribution of complexity of your plan members, okay? Now, we have another bell-shaped curve here, and here we have number of healthcare providers on the y-axis, and that could be the doctor, the nurses, the, the hospital staff, et cetera. So oftentimes in uh, caring for patients, it's not just quote unquote the doctor that impacts their care, it's sort of the entire care team. So you can think of that as like the entire care team on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we have skill. And guess what? There is a normal bell-shaped curve distribution of skill among healthcare professionals as well. And like systemic skill, like within the, the hospital system. Okay, like as much as of course we physicians would like to think that we're all over on this side, the fact of the matter is is that we're, there's a range, right? And that range is a bell-shaped curve. All right, now what I've done here is I've basically taken these two charts and I've put them into smaller form to show that in an ideal world for population health, what you want is essentially a matching exercise where you have the least complex patients that are going to the physicians that have and the facilities that have sort of lower uh, skill sets. And that's totally fine, right? Because you don't need to, you don't need uh, quote unquote overkill for, you know, let's say flu shot or what have you, right? Likewise for medium and likewise at the very high end for your most complex patients, again, complex metastatic cancer, uh, complex uh, uh, spine surgery, etc. you would want them really to go to like the best, people who like really know what they're doing. And of course, this is in the ideal world where you would want to be able to one, identify all, where exactly where everybody is on the bell-shaped curve, and then identify where all the docs and the hospitals and all the different healthcare providers are on this bell-shaped curve, and then you would want to perfectly match them up. Okay, well of course, in the real world, that is not where, how it happens. And so here, in this miniature version of these charts, this is more a description of what the real world is like, where we will have plan members that have very low complexity going to very um, highly skilled uh, physicians. And that might actually be problematic because those uh, healthcare systems and physicians, they might actually do too much for them. Um, and so that's the sort of classic problem of the, uh, of the executive physical that does the entire body CT scan that finds an incidental nodule on a CT scan and then they have, uh, you know, chest surgery for something that really didn't need to be found or operated on in the first place. So that's a whole other can of worms. But the point is, is that there, there are some detriments for that type of situation. Now, even more detrimental to the plan is when you have an incredibly complex plan member who goes to a lower skilled uh, hospital system, physician, care team, etc. And so, and, and just know that if you don't do anything, that by, by, law, by the law of numbers, that is going to happen. And that is going to impact the quality of care and the outcomes for your plan members, and that's going to actually dramatically increase your costs. 
Let me give you a specific example. So we had a plan member for a municipality in Florida who was about a 20-year-old woman, and her father was the employee on the plan, and she had a condition called uh, gastroparesis, where her stomach would not empty appropriately. It's actually very painful. It causes a lot of nausea and vomiting, weight loss, and she was actually under the care of a gastroenterologist. But she still was going to the ER many times. She was having multiple admissions. She was in junior college and had a part-time job and actually had to drop out of both of those. And so um, we actually then matched her up with a, um, a center that actually specialized in gastroparesis. And they had a multi multidisciplinary team. Uh, it was in a city that actually was about four or five hours away. It was at a, a tertiary uh, referral center sort of hospital. But the point is, she had never made her way there before. And by matching her up with that whole entire care team that had psychologists, psychiatrists, pain management physicians, gastroenterologists, they took her from close to 20 medications down to two. And her symptoms dramatically improved. It was done through an outpatient three-week intensive program. They actually stayed up there for the entire three weeks. And it literally, like, changed her life. And her symptoms dramatically improved. She was able to go back to college. And her father reported back to us. And it, like, changed their entire family. Because, obviously, if you have a, you know, young adult who's that ill, it really impacts the entire family, including the employee, of course. And, of course, that employer wants the best for its health plan members. And at the end of the day, that ends up being much more cost effective than just continuing on with the, with the status quo. Okay, so that's how it happens at the individual level. But what can an employer as a, as a group do to put in the, the strategies in place to make that population health matching occur? And so they involve one, primary care, right? Because you want to be able to identify and, and particularly place where people are in this uh, continuum of complexity. And just being able to identify that with primary care is a great way to do that. It's actually the way most of the world does this, right? So this is where almost every other country's uh, healthcare system is actually very highly primary care based. And it's actually the sort of secret weapon to their higher quality and lower cost care is their greater use of primary care versus our lesser use of primary care. So that's number one. Number two is COE, which is centers of excellence. That is to say, hey, look, for those 17 percenters that are very complex, we absolutely need to get them to the most highly skilled uh, physicians. And then uh, lastly, okay, you actually have to get them there, right? You actually have to have behavior change. So you have, you have to go to that BJ Fogg model of behavior change of where behavior modification is a function of the motivation, the ability, and the trigger. And I would encourage you to watch my behavior modification uh, video that goes into more detail about that. You're okay. That's fine. You might be saying to yourself, Dr. Bricker, that sounds like a lot of money to put that in place. It sounds like a lot of work. And it sounds like a lot of time. And the answer is yes, yes, and yes. And I will tell you that I know that this works because it's exactly what John Torrance did in the company that solved healthcare at Serograph. And yes, it did take a lot of money. And yes, it did take a lot of time. And yes, it did take a lot of work. Now, it more than paid for itself. In fact, I think it paid for itself like 15-fold in terms of the decreased healthcare costs. So as an employer, just know that whenever you're making a decision to not do these things, you're essentially, whether you realize it or not, you're making a decision to allow this population health mismatch to continue. So I guarantee you that on your plan, you will have situations like this young woman that I described, they will just happen and they will continue to happen. Okay, fine. So that's an ideal world is putting in all of those solutions. And I understand that not all employers are in a place where they'll be able to do that. So what do you do first, right? How do you prioritize this? I would actually prioritize it backwards. I would prioritize it in the behavior modification first, right? Because so many people these days think about, okay, we've got artificial intelligence and big data and analytics that'll help, you know, analyze the population. And let's say you solve for that. Let's say you exactly knew where everybody was on that curve. Okay. And then you have physician scorecarding and doing analytics, uh, analytics on the, on the uh, provider claims. So let's say you could uh, absolutely map exactly where each provider was on there. At the end of the day, if you can't change this mismatch into that match, which is the behavior modification, if you can't do that, it's all for naught, right? It's all just an academic exercise. So using a either a pilot program approach or starting small and just to say, hey, what are some ways we can um, facilitate behavior change in maybe some of the employee population? 
And this is where the behavior modification is very company specific. And obviously, for companies that have highly concentrated employees, like in Sarah, you can do a nearsight onsite clinic. But for some employers, that will never work because they have a highly dis geographically distributed workforce. I get that. That is okay. Um, I will tell you that uh, other employers that we have worked with, they had like 60 wellness coordination coordinators, and they used those on-site wellness coordinators that were actually, that's not, that wasn't what their job was. Their job was foreman, et cetera, but they happened to wear that hat. And that is where those folks became the trusted resource for things, employee benefits related, and all the messaging and all the behavior modification was put out through those 60 people across an organization of like 4,000. And that worked great for them because they were a rel relatively low turnover environment, so they could do that. Um, so uh, for other employers, they've had to use things like, hey, you know what, we're just going to have to use uh, pre-certification in order to do that, or what are considered hard gates. But so there's more than one way to do this, and there's more than one way that will be appropriate for different employers. But really the take-home message from today is that if you don't start going down this road, that your plan will sort of by its very nature have plan member complexity, provider, skill, mismatch. And that mismatch is going to be detrimental to your employees, to their families, and to the financial performance of your plan. And thank you for watching A Healthcare Z.